it to start. Any question we should address first? Do you have any questions about anything regarding this class? Assignments, uh, exams, anything? No? Okay. Okay, so let's start with, um <coughs> so what we've been talking about are dialects, right? Everybody speaks a dialect, everybody has an accent. Dialects are gonna vary in their phonology and they can also vary in their syntax. So this class is not a lot, uh, you know, at all about um, linguistics, formal linguistics. So we don't spend time talking about what syntax is and phonology, but you should know that phonology is describing the system of sound of a language, right? You probably know that. Syntax is more about the structure and word order, right? And um, this is the case that dialects are gonna vary in phonology and syntax. They need to vary at least in one area, right? If they don't vary, it's just the accent we will talk about different accents, not different dialects, right? So we talked about that on Monday. Okay, I'll show you a video. So where we, we see a bit of, um, I should have it here. No, it's not here. That's from Monday. Across. Across the Verrazano Bridge. The only exciting thing about it. Who said I was getting rid of it? Give me a minute, Bert. We're in the middle of practice, Leanne. You can thank me later. This is The Blind Side, directed by John Lee Hancock in 2009, and we're looking at Sandra Bullock doing a Memphis, Tennessee accent. This team is your family, Michael. You have to protect them. Like the way she says Michael, and it's a little bit nasal. You can thank me later. You know, that kind of a tighter Tennessee accent that's not real drawly down in here. Some of the things that make a Tennessee accent different from like a Texas accent, the, the jaw is a lot more tight. So the sounds are gonna be a little bit flatter, a little bit wider, like up in here and the what. She really grasps, I think, the placement of it. And I will be by there after a while. I gotta call you back, bye. When she says, after a while, there's that WH, but then she says, I gotta call you back, ack. And then the tongue drops down a little further than it would if it was saying up in here, I gotta call you back. And then when she just went back, it dropped into more of a standard. My name is on it, deliver what I ordered, all right? Thank you. When you say what, the mouth is gonna be tighter up in the back, and then it's gonna just flip down a little bit there, what, ought, and it's gonna scoop back a little bit. And then you get to hate your W's. You can just go, Huh, huh, instead of wuh. Other dialects where, where you'll get more of a huh, more of a schwa sound, 
uh, but the hua, that's nice and, and a little bit more north. It also gives that emphasis that she's choosing to use to put her foot down there. When you're playing someone who, real, who existed, then you gotta listen not just for the general accent, but what, what are those isms? that that person has that are unique to that person. Families are always rising or falling in America, am I right? Who said that? Hawthorne. What's the matter, smart ass? You don't know any Shakespeare? This is The Departed, directed by Martin Scorsese in 2006. So we're gonna look at three actors from this film, Mark Wahlberg, Martin Sheen, and Leonardo DiCaprio. Mark Wahlberg is the only one who's actually from Massachusetts. I know what you are, okay? I know what you are and I know what you're not. Obviously, Mark Wahlberg is all over the Boston. I know what you are. That's that ah, uh, totally relaxed. So it's not R, it's not ah. Uh, it's I know what you are and I know what you're not. Ah and not, strangely, are very similar. Like if it's in New York, not and ah are going to feel really different. But for Boston, they're really similar. Do you want to be a cop or do you want to appear to be a cop? When Martin Sheen says cop, it's nearly there. But when you get that ah for a Boston, it's like your tongue is a dead fish. Ah, ah. It weighs like a brick. So it's not ah. That'd be more into, like, Brooklyn. A lot of guys want to appear to be cops. You gun, badge, pretend they're on TV. And then it just, it's just gone. He's got kind of the rhythm, but it's just not, like, that open. It's a little bit tight. I think he was just from Ohio or something. I'm all set without your own personal job application. The right? did you say to me? And Leo is so in the emotion, and sometimes when we get in the emotion, the accent goes out the window. They're kind of painting it in that it's okay for him to just, like, sometimes have one and sometimes not. The only... Next part on Lady Bird. About 2002, is that it's a palindrome. This is Lady Bird, directed by Greta Gerwig in 2017, starring Saoirse Ronan, who's an Irish actress. Oh, so now you're mad. No, it's because just you're I being wanted ridiculous to because to you have a... Well, this is set in Sacramento, Northern California. So when she says, because I wanted to, to listen to music, I wanted to, that wanted, I call it a hard N. It's not wanted, it's not wanted with a D, it's just wanted. Some of the distinctions of a Sacramento or Northern California accent, people tend to soften the consonants a little bit. Like when she says East Coast, those T's are very East Coast. But if you put those consonants in, people might feel like you're pissed off or something. So it tends to be pretty relaxed in the mouth, not a lot of diphthong, really what we would call probably a pretty standard accent. The thing about emotional scenes is that it can be really hard to maintain something that doesn't feel like you because you're in your most primal state. I'm not going to a f***ing university that's famous for its f***ing agricultural school. The way she says school in this American accent, it goes out, you know, school. She'd be used to school. So it'd be like, er. There's so much that's different in Ireland. I mean, the, the melody, you know, and the, and the tease and the way it's so soft, it's like water. But to take all that and open it up a little bit at the corners of the mouth and let it just sit in the mouth would be more challenging. Singing is really a whole different territory. It can be easier sometimes to sing in an accent because you hold the vowels more. For whatever reason, a lot of people can at least sing in an American accent. Everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody says don't walk on the grass. She nails it. She totally nails it. Who? Who is this? The hunt buddy, I know that. This is Brokeback Mountain, directed by Ang Lee in 2005, and we'll be looking at Anne Hathaway's southern accent. She's originally from New York. It might be some pretend place where a bluebird sang and there's a whiskey spring. The way that her mouth is kind of puckered down here, that's gonna work real well. So you can see it real well in this scene because it's nice and close, what's going on here. And then when she says close or or call or something, when she's got an L word, you can see that W happening. You've been going up to Wyoming all these years. Why can't your buddy come down here to Texas and fish? It's kind of a fishing melody. Why can't you do this? Hmm? It's got a bit of weight to it. That kind of melody is quintessential Texas. You know you're worse than Bobby when it comes to losing stuff. You know you're worse than Bobby when it comes to losing stuff. That uh 
is a little more forward it's up in here you know if someone has the same melodic pattern every single time and if they have a lexicon of all the different melodies they might have you know there's more flexibility there it feels more natural her posture is great her armature her face is nice and relaxed which is important for this kind of accent you're gonna feel it right down in here we'll be lifting up a little bit in the back of the tongue to get some of that twang happening but it's not real tight it's nice and loose and it's just letting the sound roll out your mouth and settle right down in here. I thought you were going to call. I thought you were. Good way to practice your accents, right? Did any of you recognize your own accent in that video? No? Right? No. Okay. Just wondering. So what did you notice in that video that was interesting? I'm going to turn on the lights a little bit. Oof. So you can go back to it. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah. yeah it, it surprised me a bit. Did it surprise you? But like, uh, think about Celine Dion. You don't hear a Quebecois accent when she sings. So I was thinking about that. It was quite interesting that maybe that's exactly what's happening, actually, that she can lose her accent. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that the, a lot of the Canadian kids kind of sing like American accents. And I noticed that yours kind of copied like American rock music. Yeah, they did on some songs. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 I was a bit surprised by that because it means that they do go into that emo emotional state kind of thing. They don't control actually completely what they are. Um, so they're really in their character, right? Quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That was really interesting what she was saying. The details she was giving, indeed, about the lax and relax. Um, I really like when she said the dead fish in your mouth, you know, that accent, the Boston uh, eh, was quite a, a good image to think about, right? So those, we, we mentioned, I mentioned that tiny bit on Monday that there's going to be differences across dialects in what, how you pronounce the consonants and the vowels, right? And, uh, and if you don't know much about, that's something we talk about in 201 link to a one, that the, the vowels are actually positioned in the mouth, right? So the tongue is interacting with the opening of the mouth, um, and we can go up and down and you know, front and back, right? So there are actually a lot of things we can do, right? Yep. Yeah, so you're going to find... So across dialects, like across the world's dialects, you're going to find different. So we try to um, account for those, what we call the inventory of sound for each language, right? And when I'm saying language, uh, in, it works for dialects because it's, it's a language, right? And so you're going to have the, you know, the presence of, for example, a back vowel A or not, for example, right? Across dialects, you're going to have those vowels that were going to be represented or not. Um, there was that great shift, a vowel shift, uh, historically, that introduced in English the, the diphthongs, the I, owl, and so on, right? It's, it's fairly new in history, right? And those are part now of the English, you know, standard, non-standard, whatever, dialects of English, okay? Yep.
So, yeah, some of you talked about this in the discussion and um, in the on Moodle. That's something that was invented and to make it accessible for English, you know, uh, speakers from England, American speakers from the States, right? And it's kind of in between. So imagine that it's something that is, it's it was for the radio, right? <coughs> Only. Um, so imagine uh, we invent language sometimes to make it, you know, kind of fairer. So you can think about, it's a bit of a stretch, but Esperanto, right? So Esperanto was a language that was invented completely that had different type of, um, um, you know, uh, characteristic depending, it was resembling different type of European languages, right? And was taught to people and they were trying to use it as a universal language, right? Anyway, so that's the kind of the same idea with the transatlantic, um, yeah, English. Okay, we'll talk a bit more because I think it's quite interesting and when we talk about power and language, we'll talk about different and why is English so prevalent in the world, right? We know the answer to that question, but so um, the native variety of English, right? You, you think about England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, right? Australian English, New Zealand, South African, varieties of American English and varieties of Canadian English, right? All of these are native varieties of English. And again, in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about why English is so present in the world, not for the best reasons. Um, the term word Englishes is used to describe the many varieties, right? Um, around the world to cover what we call the non-native and you have to draw a distinction here, right? Indian English, for example, is considered to be a non-native uh, variety, but you're gonna have native people of Indian English, right? So draw that distinction. Singapore, uh, Nigerian English, Jamaican, so there's gonna be a lot right, of variety. And why is this a, a meaningful distinction, okay? Uh, when did Irish English become a native English? Um, and they are native speakers, so what I was saying of Indian English, right? Um, so we'll talk about this a bit more when we talk uh, in of the unit five, okay? Notable dialects of American English, so we'll talk a bit about those um, characteristic today. So Appalachian English, Ozark, Southern English, and African American English, and I'll talk more about this next week. We'll talk uh, on Wednesday next week of AAE for short, okay? Let me talk a bit about the syntactic differences between dialects, okay? If you go to the Yale Grammatical Diversity Project, uh, you'll see that um, people have been interviewed, right? And they rank actually their preference. I'll be right there. They rank their preference in terms of um, uh, do they accept a sentence or not? So something like you done your homework, right? Or you finished your homework and so on. Yep. So uh, I think you have to you uh, you have to go back to the history, right? Um, so uh, remember that there's there was a lot of migration. So the the main thing, of course, is colonization, right? So at one point in history, England uh, dominated the 25 percent of the earth, right? And so that's how English became one of the most popular, but u in use uh, language, right? And this is where you're going to have uh, native and non-native varieties of English, right? And so we consider them dialects, right? Um, yeah. So you, we, we talk about varieties is another word to talk about inside its own. So I'm going to be able to understand someone who speaks a dialect of English, right? So it's going to be a variety, right? of, um, for example, American English, but 
we have to add to this uh, distinction English World English is, is what we are describing when we talk about non-native varieties. Okay. Okay. So if you look at the Yale Grammatical Diversity Project, you're going to find information. So one of the syntax, uh, uh, you know, uh, dialectal differences that some in some, uh, and so I give you right under. In what right dialect do we find a prefix? Um, it's attached to the verb or form, so to the verb, right? And it's inflected uh, with the suffix ing, that verbal form, okay? And um, I know it was uh, telling the truth, but I was uh, coming home, right? Okay, so those that you that you can hear sometimes that you heard before you were like maybe thinking that was part of the accent right but it has a syntactic actually um it's bringing something to the syntax so the to the meaning right because there is a close relationship between syntax and and meaning well she's uh, getting the black lung now and she okay so uh southern english ozark right um in Appalachian, okay? So it appears with the progressive marker, which is the ing, okay? And uh, it's not compatible though with nominal forms like hunting, uh, like the nominal form he likes her hunting. You say he likes hunting, okay? Uh, but it's not compatible with adjectives either with c that contains the ing suffix, okay? Uh, this, movie this movie was a uh, charming. So it's one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that it's going to be systematic. Everything in a language is systematic, right? So we study them and we see when they appear. Linguists do that and they account for those type of um, features, right, in dialects, like they do for. Um, you know, international or world languages, every other language, okay? An example I gave you on Monday was, so don't I, okay? Have you heard that before? So it's part of the Boston, no? It's so, uh, you hear it where the other dialects use, so do I, right? Okay, so you would say something like, um, he plays guitar and so don't I, and it means so do I, okay? So the meaning is actually affirmative, okay? So it's different from what you might have thought when you heard it, right? Some people never heard, even linguists haven't heard so don't I. So it's made of so, the auxiliary verb, and the ent, and the subject, okay? So don't I. So Eastern New England used this, Boston English, okay? So it's not really negative, which is quite interesting and can be perple perplexing when you never heard, right, that? So um, when we look at negative sentences across, uh, what we see is there are some elements that are purely negative that appear in negative sentence. Those are what we call negative polarity items right, like any or ever, right? They have to um, be present with the negation, otherwise the sentence is ungrammatical, right? So something like no swimmers showed up, but neither did any astronauts, right? And um, even though there is an end in, in so didn't words, like any or not, right? So some swimmers showed up, and so didn't any astronaut. So actually it's not bearing that negation that we need, right? There are different type of negation and um, ent is very different from not or any or ever or neither and so on. So so don't I is not really negative, right? It express agreement, right? With the previous sentence, the preceding one. And um, so we cannot say 
you know, in this in this dialect, Jordan doesn't play guitar, and so but so don't I, right? We need the positive. Okay. So are you going to start using it? Does anyone? S you don't use it. No one. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah. Ah, maybe there is a yeah change, right? They're older. Okay. That's interesting. Maybe maybe it's disappearing indeed. Right. And so don't I. Maybe you should record your grandmother. Right? Because her dialect is changing and Yep. No one else noticed it? No. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's very confusing. To make it so, uh, what you were pointing out was that it seemed you you overheard that interaction in Boston, and you were like, they seem to be disagreeing with each other, but where are they are they are actually agreeing. Think about tag questions in English. So, uh, you you don't want to go to the park, do you? Right. So it's the same kind of thing. You always have more or less an opposition, right? So I think that's what's happening here because the correct, I mean the correct. The grammatical one is has to have a positive. He plays guitar, opposition, so uh, so don't I, right? So it's a very resembling tag questions in in uh, other dialects. Uh, yeah, do you want to? Okay. Uh-huh. Very nice. Okay, so you you say something like, uh, "I almost didn't scare uh, to death. I didn't get." Yeah. I, do you have the get I equivalent, or is it not there? So it's it's I almost didn't get scared to death. To mean I almost got scared to death. That's what's interesting is the fact that semantically you have no negation, right? Um, so it happens very often actually uh, across languages. You could have a single negation when there is no meaning of negation at all. You can have two and there is only one expressed, right? In French, that's a bit the case. And there is, you know, the I didn't see nobody, right? So double negation, but actually uh, the meaning is. You're emphasizing it. Um, yeah, that's one way to look at it. Um, I, I didn't see anybody, but anybody is is a negative element, right? So it's not that. Um, right. So this is a double negation, and only one is actually um, showing up. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. It could be a tag question, yeah. Uh, what's the value and what's the goal of a tag question? It's hard to know. People study it very much, very clearly. Yeah, it could be. I didn't know that Spanish did that, actually. The like no. This no. Eh. Yeah. 
Yeah, we. I do. I do something like that with uh, what at the end, but it's not a question in French. It's uh, yeah. My dialect is like this, but it's never. It's in declarative sentences, so it's kind of yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it does come. Uh so it's quite complex, right? You have to be careful about the complexity because very often we don't we don't suspect how complex things can be, right? So some dialects use double models, okay? So something like so models uh, you probably use them every day. It's can, should, would, shall, which I don't use. English, British English use shall. Shall we go to the store? <laughs> yes, and we lost it actually in you know in in dialect, uh, and you might hear it sometimes if you want someone you know someone wants to actually sound English, like you're gonna have that. Shall we go to the store? It doesn't have any type of. Um, I'm, I'm making fun because it, it's I, I find it very you know entertaining because it's different from. It doesn't want to sound English, honestly. No, it's not English. Like it's more like. It has that posh type of association, and it's yes, not, English. right? But there is always that association, right? So it's quite interesting. So those are type of models that you can find. So some dialects use, you know, two, for example, double models. The rules are very strict. Again, it's going to be systematic. You cannot do everything you want, right? So I don't think I have any grants you might could apply for, or you, we might can go up there next Saturday. What could be the meaning of those? Pick one and tell me. This thing here, I might should turn over to Anne. What would be the meaning? Pick one and let me know. Andrew? Yeah, so what you did was to use an adverb instead of using a, a, a second model, right? We might be able. Um, and can, can always has that kind of, it's, it's not so much ability, but it could be time ability, right? Uh, uh, we might be available, right? Um, each of the models are gonna have a specific meaning, right? Um, it's completely abstract from the notion of tense. It doesn't carry any kind of tense information, right? So it's the rest of the verb that will carry this. Here we are in the present or future, uh, close future, right? Of, you know, this thing here, much should, right? There is the sense of obligation, for example, in should, right? Um, shall is different. Um, okay. Can and could are very close, but they're slightly different as well. Okay. So where are those double models used in Southern English, South Midland, which is, uh, which includes Appalachian English and Ozark English? Um, most commonly, might, may, or might is the first model in the double model se sequence. Okay. Needs washed. So we, we talked about this on Monday. I give you those examples. Um, and there are different, you know, variation. Um, it means something. So the, the construction is like this. It, it's a need, the verb need, or want, or like, and a passive verb, right? The washed, the ed is characteristic of a passive. This car needs repaired, okay? Um, and so in other dialects, you would hear this car needs to be repaired or this car, this car needs repairing, right? Okay, so it's in Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, Central Indiana that you hear those, right? <coughs> Some examples, Cindy, this one, just woke up and probably wants fed. Okay, 
So if you want to start a dictionary, you know, on dialects of English, you can do that. You can take notes on those examples. Um, it will ease communication when you travel, right? The dog sure does like petted, right? So again, think about that other dialects would be um, saying like to be petted, right? Okay. Uh, so, an adjective won't do it, so you can have uh, an adjective after this in this construction of, uh, you know, because it's a passive, right? It's different from some telling you again that there are some constraints, right? And those are respected across, okay? It washed could be seen as a, an adjective, right? It's not. It's a passive, right? It's a verb. Well written is an adjective, and it, so the, this letter is well written, right? But you won't have this letter needs well written, okay? And others, you know, dialects would say something like this letter needs to be well, well written, okay? Negative concord, this is what we were talking about a minute ago, right? So there is more than one negative element in the sentence, but the sentence is interpreted as having only a single one, right? I ain't never been drunk, right? So the negation is being buried on the, the, uh, the auxiliary ain't. It's the ain't form, which is different from not. Okay, syntactically. Age ain't nothing but a number, right? Nobody couldn't handle him, okay? Think about Spanish, think about Italian. This is exactly, and Quebecois, it's exactly what's happening in Spanish and Italian, right? Uh, non, ha, non, ha, non ha visto nessuno, I haven't seen nobody. Okay, nessuno is nobody. It's the same thing, okay? So we find those patterns across languages, right? Not only in dialects. Southern English, African American English, Appalachian English, right? In Czech and Romanian, too, okay? Questions about this? Don't you start saying this? Because we, we start hearing in, in the media <coughs> which is always the reference, if it's the present, if it is present, if it's present in the media, you know, in any kind of whatever it is, um, TV show, for example, it means that it's starting to, to be known and it's actually already in the language standard. And so actually double negative, I've, I've started her a yeah, couple of years back, I think, in TV shows. Pay attention and, and notice if you hear them, okay? <coughs> yep. Negative concord, that's, uh, we talked about this, the non copula. So that's one of the famous example of dialect, right, having this. So it's where we omit, right, the form of the verb be, which we uh, call the copula, right, in syntax. That's the term we we'll use. So we we'll hear, you'll hear things like e fast in everything you do. Some of them big and some of them small. E an expert, right, or e smart, okay? So this is in African American English for the dialect, American dialect. It's present also in Arabic, in Russian, right? In Hebrew, in ASL, American Sign Language, in Bengali, in Turkish, in Japanese, etc. Okay? So very often this is what we do. We're gonna find commonalities across languages of the world. Okay? So it's very common to see those um, you know, features happening in dialects 
So it could be for, you know, because they are actually, you know, very commonalities in the history, in the change, we often see languages change in the same direction. There are patterns, for example, the negation, it changes over time, the expression of negation, and there's a very strict type of pattern that we see happening across languages, right? It moves the negation over time, and it's always in the same direction. So it's really interesting because it happens in dialects, in languages, it's you know, everywhere. It's predictable a bit, those changes over time. There are two different ins instances of null copula that are much more widespread and not limited to AAE, right? In yes, no questions, you're going to the party, right? And uh, newspaper headlines, tribe office officials acquitted in North Dakota pipeline protests. That's one example, a couple of examples of, you know, widespread null copula. So there are places, though, where the neural copula cannot appear. So again, it's going to be systematic. It's not across the board. It's restricted to some environment. Okay. So in anything other than the present tense, you cannot have the null copula. She was liking me, right? Past. She was liking George too. Uh, you cannot say she liking me or she liking George too. Right? Just say something. So there is a notion, or if this is something we will talk about next week, is that there is information about when it's happening. Okay? Intense. There are aspects, what we call aspects, right? So you probably know about, you know, <coughs> tense and the fact that there is information in the verb form, the ing, for example, is what? When you have she was running, what does it tell you, the ing? What is the ing form telling you in she was running? Yeah, so Yanjini is, is a progressive form, it's an aspectual form, right? It tells you about the information, it gives you information about that there was a, you know, a process, right? And possibly something happened during that event, right? So this is what we call the aspect, right? Information, okay? So no copula is dependent on this, right? The null copula cannot appear in general in any place where the verb would have been anything other than is or are, right? I'm driving to Amherst. The copula here cannot be dropped. It won't say I driving, right? To Amherst, okay? Another example is that if you can't use a contracted auxiliary, <coughs> you cannot have a null copula, okay? I don't care what you are, but not I don't care what you're or what you, right? I don't care what you, you cannot drop, you cannot, you know, use a null copula in that context, okay? So again, it's very restricted, very clear. Questions? Okay, let me go to the Yale <coughs> diversity website.
So what are you going to have in this? So um, or different type of constructions. Here is, here is you some money. Are you done your homework? Okay. Most babies like cuddle. That's exactly what I was telling you about. Yes, do you have a question or comment? Ah. Okay, can you repeat louder? So no, those are, you know, because it's systematic across the entire language, it's, it's the dialect that it's like that, okay? Someone was asking about slang on, online, right? So on Moodle, Moonami. Slang is going to be part of a language. It's not in. It's just a small part, right? It's going to be usually lexical items, right? So you're going to have slang, right? It's going to be. Um, each language is going to have its own slang, right? Okay. Very often, what you hear is that A E is just slang. It's just so not true. It's a language, right? It's a dialect, and it has rules. That's the the thing that you have to kind of remember. Slang is usually lexical item, and you're always going to have slang in, in the language, okay? And you're going to have, you're going to have different type of lexical items, meaning words, being shared by different dialects, right? But they are, you know, they, they come up. <coughs> and you can find them across, okay? Those are some of the example. There, there is something bad wrong with her. Jordan has yet to read it, and so has Pat. The meaning of this, I just don't know, right? I think it means that Jordan hasn't read it, and Pat hasn't either, but I'm not sure. It could, it's possible that Pat has read it, actually, but not Jordan, right? So it's, it's going to be not completely transparent, some of those meanings, right? because it's not part of our dialect, my dialect, for example, right? Okay, so take a look at this and see if you can identify some of those constructions that you use yourself in your dialect, or if it's someone in your family or a friend, right? Do that when you have some time uh, over the next week. So we won't be meeting on Monday and we'll have a lecture on Wednesday. You do have discussion section, and you're gonna work on homework four on Friday, right? The next two Friday, you're gonna be working on homework four in groups, okay? So have fun. Um, yep. sorry, I couldn't quite understand the quiz. Uh, yes, the, the quiz, the quiz four, sorry. that was Monday. Ah, yeah. email me. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. Thanks. Email me. We'll talk.